Welcome to Still Potable. I am Sam Jam Packer, joined by Brian B. Rob Rob of MassLive.com. We are normally joined by Jay King of The Athletic, but he is absolutely addicted to basketball and has probably been watching the tournament for nine hours straight. He is a fiend, uh, so we gave him the night off. But the three of us together, we are Still Potable, the best Celtics podcast out there. You can find us every single day on Patreon. Go to patreon.com slash still potable. We have different tiers, but if you want that Celtics content every single day, you can find us there. Uh, it's a fun little community. We've got a nice uh, chat that's on the Patreon app. We have a great time over there, so I highly recommend you guys go out and check it out. That's again, patreon.com slash still potable. Today we are on CLNS. Uh, we are presented by Prize Picks. This is the free version of Still Potable. And we are talking about, well, we got to get some B-Rob's thoughts about the uh, shockingly, and uh, Celtics played an actually an interesting, compelling game. Uh, and so we'll talk about that. And then we'll break down uh, kind of how they look versus the rest of the Eastern Conference and check back in with old friend Isaiah Thomas uh, towards the end of the show. But B-Rob, how nice was it to watch a, like a, a competitive basketball game for a change? <laughs> it was fun. It got there eventually. First three quarters was, uh, well, I guess not, like second quarter. I thought you were talking to my uh, uh, co B writer at Mass Life, Sweetie Toronto. In the first quarter, we were like, there's really just not much buzz for this game, even though if like Giannis not there. But then Peyton Pritchard obviously uh, sparked a little fuse there in the second quarter. But yeah, it was, it was, it was very intriguing to see again the Bucks make a run there at the end of the fourth quarter. And the Celtics clearly operating better in the clutch than they had. Uh, versus Denver and the Cavs uh, a couple weeks ago there, but certainly still some, some nits to be picked there. But um, yeah, it's just refreshing because we're not going to have any of these games left Packard in the next uh, three or four weeks. So it's it no, nice we a chance. I, th I, th I think that was like the last official like game that might matter because yes, they're going to play the OKC Thunder uh some point in April. Yes. They'll play the Pelicans. Yes, they'll play the Knicks. I think the Knicks is in the final week of the season. It's the front end of back-to-back. -back. That game, they're not going to play anyone. And the Pelicans and Thunder, they're going to have fully clinched the first seed in the Eastern Conference by then. And so I imagine we'll get kind of rests in large waves. What is the magic number three now between them and the Bucks? I think it's two, actually. It's two! It's, Even it's, less! It's, it's, it's one of those two. It's right there. Um, it is. I'll have to go back and look just to see what the record is for when teams took to clinch home court advantage in, in the conference, this has to be borderline there at this point, but I'm honestly Packer just looking forward to seeing the types of injuries. This team comes up with in the next yeah. like four weeks. On the, <laughs> the creative <laughs> injury report is going to be pretty impressive. Um, the thing that's kind of frustrating about last night is like, there was no Giannis and there was no drew. And so it was even difficult to try and gleam. Maybe this as like a preview for what a series might be because in a series against the Bucks, the biggest question is like, what is Joe Missoula going to do to defend Giannis and especially and Giannis and Dame? And so I feel like we didn't even get like a, a great answer to that question. Um, and like on the flip side of that, Joe Missoula has been very, very creative this year in terms of using Drew Holiday to kind of create wild dif uh, defensive matchups. And so we also didn't get uh that from the Celtics perspective, I think the thing that was interesting is that the Bucks were able to kind of junk up the game in the fourth quarter, go into this weird zone. It wasn't exactly a two, three zone is they kind of match up. They kind of uh, flowed in and out of it. Uh, didn't keep their structure as much, but like that did allow them to get back in the game. It was playing a two, three zone and being extremely physical. Is there any concern there from the Celtics standpoint that like, and I think Jalen talked about this after the game. Like they're really, we've we've see, heard national podcasts talk about it a lot. Like they're just the refs are letting them play more. Fouls are down, and they're really just like letting the teams be physical with the Celtics. And I kind of feel like that's how the Heat beat them last year. Um, how kind of the Warriors beat them in the finals. So, is there any concern that the Celtics kind of gave up this big lead as soon as the the Bucks went to this kind of junk defense? It has to be a little bit because this is honestly, like I said, the, the, the track record is there. And I think there's no doubt that teams are going to be throwing these types of curveballs at the Celtics. Opposed to, and I don't think it's coincidence that like 
think you know Giannis was good to go in that game, but they're like, you know what? We'll kind of save that, like, because again, experimentation, being like, all right, how are we going to handle these looks? Like, we haven't both sides really haven't seen each other at full strength for months now, and I doubt that's going to happen when they play each other in Milwaukee next month either. And so, um, but yeah, the the, the zone stuff of the Celtics until they fully solve it in the playoffs, like that that question is going to be had as as is like the fourth quarter, um, you know, question marks. They like they clearly patch things up um before it got too late on on wednesday night there but at the same time it's like uh you don't given how things look it was almost a flashback to the the cleveland game in terms of how it kind of fell apart there in a hurry so in my mind the zone probably shouldn't like if you have drew holiday and sam hauser in that game that is kind of a sneaky underrated like those are legitimately their two best three point shooters right now so i don't even know if that zone works even as well as it does uh, against that group, since guys were just missing a little bit more last night late in the game. But it's certainly something where the Celtics hope, probably hope that other teams throw that look at them more because they're going to probably see it a lot in the postseason, I would guess. Yeah, and I think M- Missoula mentioned this post game is like they first started that zone, and I think it was Chris Middleton in the bench. It was a lot of Patrick Beverly against the Celtics second unit with Javier Tillman in it, and like not a team that had played a lot of minutes together and that was necessarily ready to respond to it. And then once they think they got the starters back in there, they actually generated some good looks, um, but didn't knock down as many threes in the fourth quarter. A shame they didn't get to the 23 mark because uh, they were kind of on pace for that the majority of the game. And so you kind of expect them to um, just shoot better against it, especially uh, down the stretch. They both had, they had Al and Chris Tapps on the court. And I just don't think that's their best shooting lineup. They're all, both of those are capable shooters for, guys playing the five, but in turn, if you put their normal starting lineup or put Hauser in for any of them or put Peyton Pritchard uh, in, I think they have a much better attack. And that all being said, when it came down to like brass tacks, Jason Tatum put his head down and got to the rim and made the right play. Um, kind of putting uh Dame in the dunker spot. Like they, they, when it came down to execution at the end of the game, they pulled through and won the game. And so we've been kind of, killing them all year for their late game execution. You got to give them credit for when they pull it out. Right. Like Tim, when he needed to, he got to the line or he got layup or like got a good look to get that freed up Porzingis for the dunk there. But it is, I mean, I think I, I don't know how much you guys said on this last night, but like the Porzingis part of it, like that was kind of a game where like, if he doesn't have it offensively, then you wonder with Giannis on the floor, when that matchup happens is like, is that going to be a game where he just like, Al is just a better option for that game. If he's not hitting threes, uh, does he, is he doing enough in other parts of the game to, you know, justify him being out there with the defensive warts that he might have in that type of matchup against Lillard? Like, I don't know. That's, we saw like Dame and we saw everyone like Portis, everyone had it kind of going late in that game. And a lot of those were contested. A lot of those, you, you know, you just tip your cat on, tip your cap on. But at the same time, it was a, even though all the players weren't involved on both sides there, you did kind of see like some of the storylines already starting to emerge in terms of what that, you know, Eastern conference finals could look like. Yeah. And it was definitely wasn't Chris Tapp's best game. He did not make a three. Um, I didn't think he was that like uh, great in terms of imposing his will. I do think the defensive questions interesting just because Dame is the exact type of player that I think you get worried about with Chris Tapps is like the exact kind of guy who can exploit him either being in drop coverage or trying to just force him uh, to be on the perimeter. Um, we did see Peyton Pritchard come in for like an important defensive possession. It was so intriguing to me that I actually asked Joe Missoula a question. Great question by you. Cause I wanted to know like what's going on there and what happens. Um, and this is an interesting thing is cause like you gotta, and this is why you kind of would, it would have been cool to see Giannis in there. If you want to exploit Chris Tapps Porzingis, then you got to bring the guy Chris Tapps Porzingis is guarding into the pick and roll. Who do you who do they play on Chris Tapps on defense? Do they like leave him on, I guess, Beasley at that point. That's not like probably the most effective pick and roll uh p- a person for Dame. It, there's all sorts of like matchups that I think will be fascinating if these two teams uh play each other in a series. Because, like, obviously you're not going to put Chris Tapps on Giannis. And so then is the Giannis Dame pick and roll, everything that's what we're supposed to be so scared of, that, like, scary? And ultimately, is this, how much are you putting on Al Horford? And how much are we just going to see Al Horford? He can switch, but I also don't think putting Al Horford on isolation 
he can get by for a bunch of possessions, but how much are you relying on Al Horford to do that, uh, you know, p- possession after possession after possession in a playoff series? I think it's just like if the Celtics do have a possible flaw or a weakness on defense, I think it's it's that. But, you know, I feel like that's every team's weakness. It's not a, not every team's uh, center can guard on the perimeter. And so um, it just happens to be the Bucks have Dame and Dame was hitting just some ridiculous shots last night that no one would have been able to guard. Like that's that's just kind of what happens when you play Dame. Exactly. So it is. It's when you have guys. You know, when you decide who you're going to put on them. Like if, again, Jalen Brown did a pretty good job most of the night, admirable job. But then, is he going to be a guy who gets stuck on screens and not be able to contest against drop coverage? So like all those, like the chess match, like as you referred to here, it's just going to be fascinating. Um, like we say, if it's like when these two teams see each other. I know it's like the. For me last night, like Middleton looked pretty damn good. He's a demon. He's a known demon. He's a Celtics killer, and he looked damn good last night. And so given all, even with all their defensive woes that they rightfully have, it's just still tough to see any other team in the East beating. Maybe, again, the Heat are are like, for as much as they haunt the Celtics, they do just much to the Bucks. I feel like. So that, that matchup I would, you know, watch closely here, but it's hard to envision, like, the Cavs taking that, that team down. or Well, uh, well, We'll get to the the rest of the Eastern Conference after uh, after the break, but I do want to get to Lloyd Bruno's comment right now. He said he thinks they might pull a twenty twenty two and try Tillman in the Grant role with Giannis on defense, and I think that makes some sense. But also, if we remember what happened in that series, they left Grant open and he made seven threes in Game Seven. <laughs> I don't think Tillman is capable of doing that, and I think last night was a perfect example of like. Tillman is such a good and capable defender at that size, at that kind of like brawniness and moving his feet. But man, does he not really give you much on offense, especially when you're playing him with another big. And so I really don't know how much Tillman we're actually going to see in a potential playoff series. Yeah, that's a really good point by Lloyd, though. It's a point, and I would say I agree if you like Tillman with double bigs in the playoff against his opponent, like is a non-starter in my mind. However, just you're like, okay, Al and Porzingis are getting roasted in the pick and roll on switches. Tillman is like, play Tillman at the five. And you probably have enough offense around the rest of the floor there to get away with that, to where he can just... If he can just hang out in the dunker spot, and right. like he doesn't have to go to the corner. And that's interesting. It's like, yeah, in times when they don't have Brooke Lopez on the court, I think you probably have enough size to probably get away with that. Because I like... As good as Bobby Portis was last night, I'm fine with Bobby Portis like taking post ups or like trying to go one on one against yeah. anyone. And so I do think there's like could be an opportunity, but I think it does have to be Tillman at the five playing playing in a solo like uh, big lineup rather than kind of the the double bigs because I just don't think it's enough offense. Yeah, I think you're nailed on that, and it's but it's funny though, like of all the you know hearing of like when Grant left initially. Uh, last off season, it's like, okay, what are they going to do in these situations? And they've been so good in the regular season all year long that it's like, it just literally hasn't come up of being like, Oh man, this is, they're vulnerable here. But at this point they can, they at least address that concern by getting Tillman in that deal, which is like a, a depth move. But I think just as important is literally for this matchup for, or for a potential nuggets matchup where it's like, okay, this is a, a, a center who can switch better probably than anyone you have on the roster right now. Um, maybe Al sometimes, but by and large, I would probably take certainly mobility wise. I'd take Tillman over him at this point. And yeah, he's undersized and he's flawed and he can't really take a reliable three yet, but he rebounds. And so that's a guy you can get away with the five, as opposed to going super small of Tatum at the five, which is, could be an option too so easily, but then you leave yourself vulnerable to the, the Giannis and the Brooks of the world on the, the offensive class. Yeah. Uh, all right, we're going to hear from our friends at Prize Picks, and on the other side of the ad, we'll talk about the rest of the Eastern Conference and the biggest threats to the Celtics as we head into the playoffs. Football season may be over, but the action on the floor is heating up. Whether it's a tournament season or the fight for a playoff home court, there's no shortage of high-stakes basketball moments this time of year. Get in on the excitement with Prize Picks, America's number one fantasy sports app where you can turn your hoops knowledge into serious cash. 
Testing my skills on prize picks this season is the most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. If you have the skills, you can turn $10 into $1,000 with just a few taps. Prize picks is really simple to play, and I can make my picks and submit my entry in less than 60 seconds. Download the app today and use code CLNS for a first deposit match up to $100. Use the code CLNS for the first deposit match up to $100. Pick more, pick less. It's that easy. Welcome back to Still Potable. If you want that daily Still Potable from me, Jay King, and B-Rob, go to patreon.com slash stillpotable. Subscribe today. You can give a seven-day free trial. Try us out as we gear up for the playoffs. I know you're going to want to be subscribed when the playoffs do start because we're going to be uh, churning out tremendous content every single day over on the Patreon. Speaking also, of... Also, a big guest, big guest in the cards next week. We won't reveal who, but... Definitely a good time to I'd say the, the biggest guest we've had in the in the echelon of Abby Chin, I would say, in the same tier of uh guests coming on next week. So uh keep an eye out for that. Uh but we're talking playoffs, and I think like with nothing left to really the Celtics are clearly going to be the one seed. It's time to really start thinking about their potential playoff path, who they could play, who they could play in the second round, what those potential matchups could be. So I thought we would just go through the Eastern Conference standings, look where it is now, and then also look at, like, uh, I'm just looking at basketball reference. They have their kind of, like, projected standings, their playoff probabilities, who's going to get which seed, and try to figure out what's the most likely path for the Celtics and what's the easiest path for the Celtics. So I don't know where you want to start, B-Rob, at the bottom of the conference or uh, the biggest threat towards them? Let's start at the bottom. Okay, so right now... In the 10, 9, 8, 7 is Hawks, Bulls, Sixers, Heat. Personally, I would be shocked if the 7 and 8 seeds aren't anyone other than the Heat and the 76ers. Like, if the Bulls and the Hawks make the playoffs, the Celtics, that's a huge blessing. But they are (laughs) so far behind just in terms of talent on the court than those other teams. Maybe you can get a Trey Young game where he goes pretty... uh, just wild and scores 45 points against kind of the loser of that seven, eight game. But I would be shocked if it was anyone other than either this, the heat or the Sixers in that, in those two. Yeah. Or, or yeah. Or whatever team the, the Pacers dropped down to seven or eight too. Yeah. I, I agree. Like, it's like the bulls have been playing respectable, um, which is what, like 500 basketball for them. So it is like, they've got enough talent where they, I mean, they were, seconds away from getting into the playoffs last year and that he came um so they could you know they could put up a fight if DeRozan goes nuts but by and large unless like mb falls apart or in one of those situations that's that's the only door i can see them opening up but yeah like trey's out we don't know what he's gonna look like when he gets back in chicago is like just on the downturn so i'm with you so it's like i think if you're like you said it would be a godsend for the celtics but the, like scouting wise, I think I'm sure that the staff is spending the majority of their time on the uh, teams in the four through eight range right now, which conceivably any of those could could be at the, the playing tournament. Packard, I believe you're muted right now. I cannot hear you. Or your mic is might be disconnected here. Back? Am I back? There we go. You're back. You're back. What kind of random muting? I didn't press it. <laughs> they didn't want me to talk about the Indian Pacers. <laughs> your takes are terrible. <laughs> Mute him. I was getting too deep into the numbers about um, the six, seven, and eight seed. But yeah, it's kind of like a, a those three teams: the Pacers, Heat, and Sixers, really end up anywhere. I think there's. Who do you think is the best matchup? Who of those teams, I guess, we can include the Magic in there because there's a chance they drop two. Uh, there's not a lot of space between. I guess the Magic two and a half game lead. Let's leave the Magic out of it. Pacers, Heat, and 76ers. Who do you think is the best matchup for the Celtics in terms of uh, just easiest first round uh, playoff series? Honestly, the way the Sixers are playing, like, it's to me, it's either the Sixers or the Pacers. And I just think the Sixers have been 
so inconsistent. Like Tobias Harris is such a mess there. Even if they get Embiid back at like 80%, I just, the Pacers play the Celtics well. And Halliburton is, is a scarier piece in my mind for the playoffs. And he's been off a lot too here. So in the, since like the in season tournament. So it's, it's hard to tell, but um, I still said, you know, bring on Philly because the Pacers, I think just have more count on that roster right now from not in the, their top spot, but like through spots two through eight, two through nine to, you know, drag a six or seven game series out of Boston if they didn't show up there. But is that, am I overrating them right now? Do you feel like? It's really hard to say because we have no idea what version of Joel Embiid would play in that Sixers series. You would have to imagine it's going to be the the kind of hobbled Joel Embiid. And how many times have we seen him? Like, I, you just have zero faith in him, like coming back from a serious injury and surgery and like playing well in the playoffs. You mentioned Tobias Harris, like Philly fans loathe that man. They want him to get him out. They're really not playing well. I agree. I want nothing to do with Aaron Neesmith in the playoffs. I don't know what he's <laughs> capable of. Um, TJ McConnell? Yeah, like they have played the Celtics well. You mentioned uh, Halliburton's been hurt a little bit, and so I'm less scared of them. The one thing is, like, I think the Heat would be the toughest series, obviously, because they're the Heat. But there's some value in vanquishing your demons first round of the playoffs you haven't really been tested that much in the final two months of the season. You show, you prove to yourself and everyone else that like, fuck the heat. Like you can figure this out and, uh, and you like out coach Eric Spolstra. You put like, they're the, going to be the team that like tests you the most. And so, and if the Celtics are going to be win a championship, they're going to have to go through, through some battles. How much of, do you really want to, giant battle in the first round of the playoffs? I don't know. I think it's like a difficult question. I can see it both ways. Um, but part of me wants to vanquish the Heat. Part of me just wants an easy four-game sweep of the Philadelphia 76ers. Like that, that kind of seems like nice. Like we don't need to really be test things. Why not just get a bunch of rest in uh, and not really have that much uh, strain? Because playoff games uh, take a lot out of the players. And so – I can see arguments for both, but ultimately I think the bet, the easiest, the most fun would be beating the 76ers. Yeah. It, uh, what is it? 2020 bubbles when they had that pretty much that same scenario there with uh, a hobbled Sixers crew that they just did quick work with. But I'm interested. I would love to see like a Bucks heat first round series. Um, and I, I think do it's think highly like, probable of that. If the heat win that first play in game. Right. And so I do think, I mean, it will be fascinating to see where like, you know, teams just how prized a getting out of the play in tournament entirely just to get in the, you know, the three, six or the four or five is, but even, you know, that the stakes for that seven seed to like get to go from a, you know, potentially top 20 best regular season team ever to a, a Bucks team that is literally still trying to figure it out and has not had their like, I think last night someone they were talking about like Lillard, Giannis, and Middleton have played like three or four games together like this year period, which is absolutely yeah. wild. Um, so it is just the to, to add that, and I just think from the Celtics perspective, it's like if you can have someone take out the Bucks for you, like that's great. And I think the Heat probably have the best chance of that out of any team in the bottom half of the bracket at this point. So in my mind, like as much as you like want to maybe have a confidence boost and get get them out of your way early, it's like well getting your life easier down the road is probably is just as appealing from my standpoint. Yeah. All right. Well, talking about the kind of other half of the bracket, like presumably that second round, you're playing the the winner of the, the four or five matchup. And right now it's kind of interesting what, uh, what's going on. The, the Knicks are kind of making a push towards the, the three seed. The Cavs have been kind of falling uh, as of late. Actually, it's interesting. The, Basketball reference has the Cavs as most likely to get the two seed, the Bucks most likely to get the three seed, and then Knicks and Magic as the most likely to get the four and the five. And so I don't like, I think the Knicks will be a tough team, but I don't really have any fear of the Orlando Magic. I think the Cavs would be a, a kind of a, a tough matchup. I feel like they played the Celtics pretty close over the past two seasons. Um, but I'm, I'm, I don't know. I don't, I'm kind of surprised to see basketball reference think the Cavs are going to get the two seed. I think that the Bucks are playing kind of better basketball there. But 
Um, who do you think is the kind of the most dangerous team to the Celtics? Let's just say the Bucks get the two seed. So let's be between yeah, the Cavs, yeah. the Cavs, the Knicks, and the Magic uh, in the in a possible second round. Yeah, from the basketball reference clearly is inputting the fact that Donovan Mitchell is dealing with a knee situation right now, and um, now it seems like the word out of there is like he's just focused on the playoffs. So how much he'll actually play the rest of the regular season remains to be seen. But out of those three teams, Packer, like. It's, it has to be the Knicks is like the biggest worry in that group because, um, again, assuming they have a huge question mark of Randall's health, he still isn't practicing after he's separated his shoulder, I think, uh, over a month ago at this a point. While so, ago, yeah. Yeah. And then OG Ananobi is still dealing with this elbow thing that has cropped back up again. But talent wise, they they are at a different level than those two other teams in my mind. And they've got, just got a lot of plucky guys that um, I think could just be a thorn in this team side. Um, Orlando has a size defensively to make things interesting, but that's just not a team that can score. And yeah. I'm shocked if Orlando are... wins a, for a player off series, like they right. haven't really made it. And so, and, and not been tested at all. Um, so I would be kudos to Orlando if they make it to the second round. Right. I mean, maybe they get lucky in the fact if, if New York doesn't have them, if you, if New York's beat up, they could beat them. Like if, if Randall and OG aren't playing, I could see them getting in. That would be talk about a dream scenario for the Celtics there. If you get like a shorthanded Sixers team and then a, a year too early magic type team, then, then, and then you can potentially cakewalk into the, the conference finals, which would be a far cry from what they've had to deal with the last two years here. But it is like, do you, do you believe in the Cavs at all in terms of, obviously they've given Celtics tough games over the years here in the last during the Mitchell era like if they are fully healthy do they do they intrigue you as a, a factor they've played the Celtics tough and like we've seen Donovan Mitchell just go for some like pretty dominant scoring games we've seen Garland go off they obviously have Celtics killers Karis Levert and Dean Wade and so um I don't fully believe in the Cavs just because I feel like they so thoroughly got their asses kicked by the Knicks last year and I'm not the biggest believer in uh, JB Bickerstaff. I don't know if they have the deepest bench. Um, although Isaac Okoro is like, has been better this year. Um, but yeah, I, I think they're like, I think they're a formidable team, but I just don't, I think it's like Celtics and six. Like, I don't think there's maybe even Celtics and five. I just think their Celtics are a much better team and the Cavs, still just feel kind of weirdly balanced or like they have two big men and then two undersized guards. And I don't know what they're doing defensively. Obviously they have a lot of great rim protection, but I feel like they still just don't have a lot of guys they can throw out at Tatum and Brown. And so I don't really believe in them as playoff contenders. I mean, they're playing Marcus Morris and Tristan Thompson now. So that's like two old Celtics friends, you know, <laughs> maybe, maybe they know what's going on there. Um, I mean, I think this is the most interesting thing that's going to happen with the rest of the Celtics season is just like figuring out where this the playoff picture is going to be because there's more distance between the Celtics and the Bucks than there is between the Bucks and uh, the tenth seed Hawks, which is did I get that right? No, between the ninth seed Bulls, which is pretty crazy. Wow. Um, and that's just a completely dominant dominant season for you from the Celtics, where they're I think they're going to clinch. Maybe over the weekend, depending on what uh, happens with some other teams here. Uh, but before we go, old friend Isaiah Thomas returned to the NBA last night for the Phoenix Sun, Phoenix Suns, and played all of one minute. P. Rob, did you see what he did in that minute? Because I did not. I believe he dished out an assist. Oh, good for him! Did not get a bucket, but did dish out an assist in garbage time. Yeah, it's uh, it's fascinating to me that he landed in Phoenix. And I wonder how much is that? Do you think that's a player's decision to bring him in? Like, because it seems like, I mean, he obviously played with Bradley Beal a bunch in um, in Washington him um, this week about coming his return there. So it's like, they're running the show there, obviously. And I guess they're like, give us another shooter. <laughs> I guess so. Like, it doesn't feel like a basketball decision. It's like a guy, it's not like they brought him in and immediately brought him off the bench as like their eighth man. They put him in the one last minute of garbage time. So maybe it's just like a good vibes thing. He's never like really been a floor spacer. Um, he can shoot the ball well. Like he's always been a, a very capable three point shooter, but that's kind of a, he thrives with the ball in his hands. And I just don't think that's the type of team where you're like, 
we're going to put uh, Beal, Booker, and Durant on the floor and then just give the ball to Isaiah Thomas to like create. He, he kind of doesn't have the same step that he once had. So I think it's awesome that he's back in the NBA. I do think it's curious like that that's the team that picked him up, but I hope he gets more uh, opportunities, maybe some opportunities with those guys on the court to kind of, you know, like see what well, see what he's capable of when teams are kind of shading away from the, the primary defender. Um, so it'll be interesting to see. Uh, he just signed to just a 10-day, right? Yeah, he just signed a 10-day. But at this point, yeah, so that's probably just a – the saving somebody for the franchise at this point. So they'll probably do one more of those. And then if the quote unquote is fit is there, it's like, all right, then we'll sign you the rest of the way. But it is, I mean, you look at, we saw the Suns twice in the last couple of weeks here. And it is like that bench is just hot trash by and large, particularly offensively. So you at least have a guy there where I do wonder if he, you know, if Vogel will at some point be like, all right, like, play rotation minutes here with off the bench and see if we can, if that's because they're the path for them. I feel like it's just, they have to just overwhelm teams with offense and yeah. their bench doesn't really let them do that at this point. Maybe. And it's just like, Hey, we're going to try you at the 10 minute mark of the second quarter. And we're going to give you six minutes. And if you can score a bunch of points, then go off and like give our guys a bit of a rest and like keep us in this game. And maybe you just don't have it tonight. And so why not take a flag on him there? And so it's cool to see him back in the NBA. Hopefully he gets that chance, at least with the last remaining games in the regular season. Yeah. I, I honestly, when he started that thing in Utah, I was like, all right, this is Danny just doing him a solid, but like who is actually going to take a flyer at him at this point? But then I guess you just look around the rest of the guys available, period, on the buyout market. It's just like totally underwhelming. So yeah. for he at least has. He's like I said, has the good vibes. Is probably, is probably the best realistic shooter on the market. And um, yeah, again, I hope he hope he sticks. Hope he gets a chance or two to like you know make an impact. And I know there'll be obviously a bunch of people back here rooting for him. So that'll be um, it'll be fun to watch. It will be. The Celtics uh, return to action tomorrow against the Pistons, and then they play the Bulls on Saturday night. And so still potable. We'll be back here. Sunday night, maybe the Celtics will have clinched first seed in the Eastern Conference. Uh, again, if you guys want more Still Potable, you can go to patreon.com slash Still Potable and sign up for Monday through Friday. Um, but otherwise, you can catch us for free once a week here on CLNS. We appreciate you guys for listening, and we'll be back next week.